This is CBC Here and Now. A boom that shook the city and destroyed a Mount Pearl business. It seems there was a, an explosion early this morning. So we believe that uh, the employees were working on a, a fuel tank, uh, which carried maybe gasoline or some type of a petroleum product. It was just a normal day. We were just starting starting our business day, and all of a sudden the, the building just shook. It was, it was just, your first instinct was, oh my God, somebody's hurt. Something happened. It blew the roof off this building, sent sheet metal and debris flying just meters from these propane tanks. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper, and that explosion is tonight's top story. We go straight to Mount Pearl, where Anthony Germain is standing by in Dunneman's Industrial Park. Anthony. Well, Debbie, you mentioned debris, and you can clearly see that behind me, the devastation. It's really quite something to actually see. This morning, around 8.30, the explosion happened, shook Mount Pearl and beyond. Three people, police say, were taken to hospital. Now, the CBC's Mark Quinn is going to come in now and explain to you just what happened. Mark. Well, Anthony, uh, the first responders came here around 8.30 in the morning. They thought they were coming to a fire at first. They then learned they were coming to an explosion. And even these experienced firefighters said they were surprised by what they found. This is what the blast did to the roof of Trimac National Tank Services. And these are pieces of metal scattered up to 100 meters from the blast. Some went over these cars and landed just meters from these propane tanks. Amazingly, everyone inside the building at the time walked away from the explosion, though some were taken to hospital for observations. First responders say that when they arrived, they were surprised to find everyone on their feet. We do know that they were ambulatory uh, upon arrival, so all indications are that, uh, that they were very fortunate. Firefighters at the scene believe work was being done on a truck's fuel tank when the explosion happened. We believe that uh, the employees were working on a, a fuel tank uh, which carried maybe gasoline or some type of a petroleum product, yes. And do you think it was the fuel that ignited or fumes? Uh, it will be the fumes inside the, those tanks if that's in fact uh, the cause of this, yes. I want to thank CBC's Mark Quinn for that. And continuing our live reporting from Donovan's, I want to welcome Carolyn Stokes. Carolyn, you've been speaking with people who live in this area. This must have been a tremendous shock. Oh, it was a huge shock. I mean, that explosion was so loud, it was heard far and wide. There were reports on social media that people all over Mount Pearl and St. John's heard the explosion. But the people I spoke with earlier today, well, they practically work next door to where this happened. So for them, it was terrifying. Well, it was just a normal day. We were just starting starting our business day, and all of a sudden, the, the building shook. It shook so hard, Button felt it in his bones. It was felt more than it was heard. It was loud, but uh, the vibration and, and the feeling of the explosion was felt more than, more than anything. At first, he feared for his own employees and ran to check on them. And then I seen my co-worker, Wolf, he was running out to the back door. And when we went out through the back door, then, of course, we seen all the debris just floating through the air. It was just scary. And when I looked out, there was nothing but dust, brown dust and insulation. So they both jumped in a truck and drove up the road to get a closer look. They say the extent of the damage was shocking. The doors were blown off. The building was, was blown outwards. So something inside just had to ignite, and it was very powerful. Debris everywhere, insulation going everywhere and parts and pieces of the building. They were among the first people on the scene and worried about what they might find. Absolutely. At that point, we didn't know if there was any injuries or any fatalities. and We were just waiting for fire and paramedics. And Anthony, we now know, of course, that incredibly no one was killed in this explosion. We were told that nine people were in the building working at the time and only three of them were brought to hospital through ambulance and uh, they're all expected to recover. All right. Well, that is good news, Carol. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. And it's amazing when you think about that, if you look at the destruction behind us, to think that so many people just walked away and the injuries aren't serious. So that's the good news. Of course, still many, many questions, and we're going to explore those in our continuing coverage. Katie Breen is going to join me later to talk about the different ways that the RNC are investigating serious workplace accidents. And I'll also talk to the mayor of Mount Pearl, who was woken up just like everybody else this morning and thought that maybe his basement had blown up. That's coming up. Debbie?
What an incredible story. We will be back to you in just a little bit. Thanks, Anthony. Well, Colette Kennedy, our meteorologist, who's joining us for a couple of weeks, is here. Lots of people heard that loud explosion. I'm just wondering, did the weather contribute to enabling that sound to travel or ampl be amplified? Exactly. It's such a great question. And, you know, there are many factors that play into that. And, yes, the weather is absolutely one. Lots of different weather factors. And if we have a look, I can show you, first of all, we're just going to take a look at a, a picture here. I know this isn't Mount pearl but it's showing you some of the different things that can have an impact because we're seeing the water we're seeing the topography but also the buildings things that are structures all of that can bend sound waves now the other thing though are different factors in the weather like we're talking about so if you have a temperature inversion which we actually had a bit of one with that storm system that's been pushing through so some warmer temperatures aloft that can help to amplify the sound waves as well cloud cover you know we had that low cloud cover as well bends those sound waves and then the winds winds can carry them but also bend them and with that very strong southwesterly flow you know we've still got some of those gusty winds out there that I bet those to the northeast heard it louder than elsewhere because it would have been carried on those winds. So this is just an image. This is satellite, not the radar, from this morning between 8 and 9 when the explosion happened. You can see obviously we had a ton of low cloud cover, just a whole low cloud deck there. This is our current imagery. So we still have the rainfall warning in place for southwestern portions of the Avalon. I think Environment Canada is going to drop that as the heavier rain still pushing across the rest of the Avalon, but starting these up there. Wind warning still in place. Now, these are some of the wind gusts the strongest we saw through the day, including at St. John's, clocking in almost at 100 kilometers an hour. But I will tell you that even now, we are seeing our winds gusting at about 80 kilometers an hour. They are going to start to ease. That rain is moving away. I'll fill you in on all those details when I return. A 39-year-old woman is dead following a single vehicle accident on Veterans Memorial Highway this morning. Police say the 37-year-old female passenger was taken to Carboneer General Hospital. The extent of her injuries isn't known. The RCMP uh, says the car went off the highway and rolled over. The investigation continues. Well, that whale that was stranding itself in Harbor Grace since yesterday morning may have left. This is the minke whale yesterday. As dozens of people gathered around to watch it, the Whale Release and Strandings Group had tried to help the whale leave the harbor, but it kept returning. Wayne Ledwell with the group believed the whale was sick and wanted shallow water to rest. Today, there hasn't been much sign of it. Ledwell says it might have been blown off with the help of the wind. He says the whale's behavior seemed pretty strange, but he hopes it can pick up steam and regain its health. Bill C-45, the federal bill to legalize recreational marijuana, has now been bounced back to the Senate. The House of Commons voted to reject 13 of the upper chamber's recommendations, including one that would have allowed provinces to prohibit home cultivation of pot plants. The House did accept 27 largely technical amendments. If the Senate fights the rejected amendments, the bill would once again go back to the House, and that would delay legalization. Offshore oil exploration is being bogged down by red tape. About three years to get approval to drill an exploration well. That was one of the focuses at NOIA's annual oil and gas conference, which opened this morning in St. John's. More than a thousand delegates, delegates are taking part in NOIA's 34th conference, gathering at a time when companies have pledged billions in exploration money. But conference chair Andrew Bell says the next big development is being slowed by layers of bureaucracy at the federal level. We're not suggesting as NOIA that we take away any of the rigor of the process. What we're suggesting is we condense the time. There's no reason that we put unnecessary bar barriers or impediments in place to develop our offshore oil and gas. We are looking and benchmarking against other areas of the world. Norway does it in six months. You know, the UK is doing it in a much quicker time frame. And I think that's what's important is when you benchmark globally as to where you're doing it. We do not want to sacrifice anything with regards to environmental assessments, with regards to safety. But what we want to do is be globally competitive. 
The environmental assessment process is now being overhauled, but new rules are still a year away. Groups like Noya say Newfoundland is competing with many other countries for investment dollars, and a massive opportunity could be missed unless changes are made. The conference, meanwhile, continues until Thursday. A 57-year-old man has been charged with first-degree murder after a commuter was pushed in, uh, in front of a Toronto subway train. The suspect was set to appear in a Toronto court this morning to face the murder charge. The incident happened shortly after the Monday morning rush hour at the city's busiest station. Toronto police gave an update on the case last night. Allegations at this time are that there's an interaction between our accused and our deceased and our deceased uh, uh, is sort of pushed and uh, falls under the train. Detectives now say the suspect is known to police. They say he had a minor interaction with officers in 2015, but won't give details. The victim has not been identified. A Supreme Court judge in St. John's has thrown out child pornography charges against former Anglican minister Robin Barrett. The court ruled Barrett's rights had been violated twice by the RNC during visits to Barrett's home in 2016. An officer read him his rights but continued to question Barrett after he had said he wanted to speak to a lawyer. And the same officer returned on another date and questioned Barrett without reading him his rights. The defense argued that was a violation of Barrett's charter rights. In 2010, Barrett was sentenced to two and a half years in prison for possessing and distributing child porn. There's a call for a statue in St. John's to remember a very dark part of our past. Shauna Dissett was the last known Beothic. Proponents want this province to do more to honor Indigenous history and culture. That includes rethinking the meaning of the Discovery Day holiday. Ramona Deering reports. The wastewater treatment plant on Southside Road in St. John's. This small plaque indicating Shauna Dithit, the last known Beothic, is buried nearby. She was only 27 or 28 when she died in 1829. So, have you ever seen this before? No, never. Brianna Brown is an Inuk student at Memorial University. I don't, I don't think of this as something to remember. Shana did it. She says flowers or a statue would help. There's also a plaque in Bannerman Park. But for Brown, it's not enough especially compared to the statue of Portuguese explorer Gaspar Cort Real. That statue is gigantic, you cannot miss it. And to see that there is not a statue of Shana did it, to see that there is a statue of him still standing very tall, um, I think that is quite insulting. There is a statue on the grounds of the Beothic Interpretation Centre in Boyd's Cove. I'm trying to figure out what he's actually doing. Christopher Shepard is at Confederation Building in St. John's, studying this representation of a Beothic warrior. Plus these representations of Beothic on a coat of arms that the government plans to review. Just outside, a statue of John Cabot. Monday coming is the Discovery Day provincial government holiday. You know, it may be, you know, nice to acknowledge that John Cabot sailed here in you know, 1497, but that signaled the end of a group of people that we have to go to the rooms to learn about. I do not believe that we as Indigenous people, we were discovered. For them, contact with Europeans led to the eventual demise of the Beothic. Shepard will not observe the Discovery Day holiday, although he's not saying it should end. I want a day in this province to recognize the history of Indigenous people and the Indigenous people that exist here. One that everyone celebrates. And he's not saying the John Cabot statue should be removed, but he wants a more visible monument to the Beothic. After all, the city has statues of dogs. Thursday, as part of National Indigenous Peoples Day, there will be a ceremony here at 6 a.m. in Bannerman Park to pay respect. Ramona Deering, CBC News, 
St. John's. A paint company in British Columbia has renamed a color as a tribute to Victoria Best, the music teacher from Clarenville who took her own life last year. Best used the color Robin's Egg Blue to paint her piano while decorating her music studio. And her close friend, Megan Pollard, says the piano and the paint that was on it became a symbol of Victoria's life. Pollard says when the manufacturer recently announced it was discontinuing the color, she sent a note to try to save the paint and suggest a new name. The company agreed, something Pollard says is important to remember her friend. It's a really great way to not only keep Vic's memory very vibrant in our community because I know that the reaction from community members was very positive about this pink color. But I think it does spark that bigger conversation, which is what was important to me and would be important to Vic as well, I think. The color is made by the Fat Paint Company and will now be named Belle after, after Victoria Best's first rescue dog. You are looking at a live shot of the upward effects of the blast of what's left of the Trimac Tank Services Company in Donovan's Industrial Park in Mount Pearl. This morning's blast is now under investigation. After the break, how the RNC plans to get tougher on workplace accidents.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A St. John's rheumatologist is joining a freedom flotilla opposed to the Israeli blockade of Gaza tomorrow in Portugal. Dr. Majid Kreshi calls the conditions in Gaza inhumane. The ongoing blockade by land, air, and sea was imposed in 2007 to purportedly protect Israelis from terrorism and other hostilities. But the toll on the Palestinian people has been condemned by many worldwide. Dr. Kreshi flies to Lisbon tomorrow to join the Norwegian vessel, The Return, which left Norway in April and arrived in Portugal today. It is one of a number of vessels in the Freedom Flotilla Coalition, and Dr. Kreshi she joins me now. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me here. What is this flotilla all about? As you started saying, I mean, uh, the world has been watching with horror, I think, in many ways, what's going on in the Gaza Strip. The blockade, the Israeli blockade, the inhumane conditions there, there are uh, uh, little electricity. People have uh, little uh, work. Many people are, uh, I mean, I'm a doctor. After three wars in the last 10 years, thousands of people were injured. Hospitals are bursting at the seams. So there are many, there is this group of people who felt worldwide, they are uh, representing many countries, many uh, organizations that felt that there is something that can be done. And by this, this the simplest thing is to move on and try to help uh, break in this blockade, this siege. Mm -hmm. And while doing this, trying to uh, spread the world what's going on and press, pressing our governments, the uh, governments of these people uh, who are part of the flotilla, to do more to help uh, ease this blockade and ease the, the, the agony of these people. So you're motivated by what you have observed over the years. I understand you, your family fled the West Bank in 1967. Do you still have family in the region? Yes, uh, I still have uh, distant relatives in the West Bank, but my uh, mother, my immediate family are spread all over the world, like many people who are from Palestine. And there are some, uh, my mother is actually in Jordan. Hmm. So I, uh, you know, I go there uh, frequently to see them. But again, you know, this is an important issue. It is personal, but yeah. more than it is personal, it is also something that human. I mean, we cannot just sit down and watch the agony of other people. In this case, as I said, there is a direct connection, but even if not, without trying to do something. Well, help us understand the number of people who are in a small area. You made a comparison to geography in Newfoundland. So the, the population of Gaza is about two million and they are living in a very small strip of land. Uh, that's why it's called actually the, the Gaza Strip, which is really not much bigger than Greater St. John's. It's about 25 miles long by five miles wide. So you can imagine two million people living there with very little uh, resources and they have no way to get out. I mean, there are things, as we all see, it's parts of it, but simple things like you are sick, your uh, loved ones are sick, you cannot go and find the hospital, find the medications, because it has to go through the checkpoints and at the mercy of whoever, in this case it's the Israelis, who are surrounding the area and blocking the uh, flow of people and, and supplies. Speaking of blocking, I mean, uh, I don't think you anticipate that this flotilla is actually going to reach the Gaza Strip, do you? And if it doesn't, what will be success in your mind from this venture? In the past, there are few that managed to go there. Having said that, the last one, which was 2016, is actually one of the members of that flotilla, the women's boat to Gaza, was uh, Professor uh, Marilyn Porter from St. John's. They didn't reach it, and yes, many often it's stopped in the international waters, which shouldn't be by the Israeli uh, Navy often. So I don't, we, the, the chance of this flotilla reaching is not high, although we hope it is, because there are things that to do. But more importantly, the idea of uh, the, the, uh, aware, raising the awareness, pushing other people to play their part, doing something is by itself a success. Mm -hmm. And that is going on through the, the Mediterranean, through Europe, and hopefully through the other parts, the participants. Dr. Majid uh, Kreshi, thank you so much and uh, stay safe. 
Thank you very much. Appreciate it. More live coverage from Donovan's Industrial Park here in Mount Pearl, where there was a major blast this morning. The RNC's Major Crimes Unit is actually investigating what happened today. And up until recently, that would not automatically have been the case. The CBC's Katie Breen has been speaking with the police chief. And Katie, what have you learned? Well, before when a serious workplace accident occurred, police would come, they'd arrive and secure the scene, but occupational health and safety would actually take over the investigation. Now, police plan to take the lead. For instance, today, the RNC is treating the explosion at Trimac as if foul play is suspected. They're looking for criminal negligence. When occupational health and safety heads an investigation, only fines can be hand out, handed out. But when police are involved, jail time is a potential punishment. Supervisors or managers can actually be criminally charged for not providing a safe place to work. I think we do have a responsibility here to, to make sure that we do the right thing here with regards to, to the criminal code. And uh, so we're going to shift to make sure, like I said, to make sure that if there is criminal negligence involved, that we lay the appropriate charges. Now, I spoke to the chief of police yesterday, obviously before this occurred, but the constabulary did confirm that it is leading the investigation into this incident. So, Katie, when did the police actually start investigating these, these kinds of incidents? Well, actually, just recently, the Calgary police are actually training the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary around logistics of workplace accident investigations because they are already taking the lead on cases in their area. You might remember this case from a little over three weeks ago, 26-year-old Chris Chris Fifield fell from the top of a construction site in downtown St. John's. He died on scene. The RNC confirmed yesterday that it's investigating this case also. They're hoping this will make employers more accountable. Tells an employer or a supervisor or any person who directs another person to do work that you have to make sure that that work that you're directing them to do, that it's safe and that they're not exposed to bodily harm. So I think there's going to be greater awareness and it'll make our workplaces safer. Now, in Chris Byfield's case and at the scene behind us now, police are leading those investigations. There haven't been charges laid, but now it's a possibility. All right, Katie, appreciate that. Thank you very much. No problem. Right, the CBC's uh, Katie Breen here live with me in Donovan's Industrial Park. Now, coming up in just a bit, I'm going to speak to the mayor of Mount Pearl. He, like many people, was shaken this morning. We're also going to talk about some of the potential risks when one community has such a large industrial footprint. Stay tuned. Off to bigger things. Students in St. John's bid farewell to their fish friends that's just ahead.
Welcome back. Colette is rejoining me. But before we talk about the weather, some really nice video. Just have a look. <laughs> Elementary students from 14 schools in and around St. John's released salmon fry into Rennie's River today. The schools involved have been raising salmon eggs since late February. It's part of the Salmon Federation's Fish Friends program. And the groups say it's a great hands-on opportunity for these kids to learn about salmon's life cycle. But also our reporter Megan Kwan, who went to the release, told us that some of the students even gave their salmon a name. Of course they, they would. Did. Well, that just sounds fishy to me. <laughs> oh, I know. Terrible, oh. terrible. I, I think I'd name mine Sammy McSalmon Face. Okay. Do you remember Bodie McBoat Face? Oh, yes. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll have to think about my okay. name. You've got me. You've got time. Well, <laughs> fuddled here. <laughs> well, I do the weather. <laughs> but uh, speaking of the weather, uh, as you did say uh, last night, temperatures would warm up, but we'd have a lot of rain. And Bingo. Yeah, that's exactly what we have. And we can have a look at some of the current temperatures we're seeing out there and some of the milder conditions that we have. And the other thing, as I had mentioned uh, just earlier in the show, we still had those warnings in place and I was uh, fairly certain Environment Canada was going to drop them. And indeed they have since the show began. So now we're looking at uh, that wind warning is gone, although we've still got some winds and I'm going to show you those in just a moment. But also that heavier rainfall warning that we had for southwestern sections of the Avalon, that's out of the way too, because you'll see when I show you the radar, the rain's kind of pushed away from that as it's moving from west to east. So just to look at some of the temperatures that we have, St. John's sitting at 15 degrees right now. There's some of that milder air. Badger as well at 15. But look at some of the cooler air we're seeing towards the coast for Labrador. Happy Valley Goose Bay, though, you guys at 13 degrees right now. The wind's a big factor. First of all, just looking at the sustained winds, okay? These aren't even the gusts yet that we're getting into. And you can see for the Avalon, we still have some of the sustained winds, 40 to over 50 kilometers an hour Bonavista starting to uh ease up a little bit there and that's really what's happening now between now and the next couple of hours we'll really begin to see these easing up wind gusts where we have them there are still some of those gusts we've seen within the hour anyway that have been up there towards 80 kilometers an hour now we're getting into the forecast for those winds and you can see what happens as we go into the evening hours look at how they drop right off and then coming down even further really beginning to ease as we head into the overnight but the next couple of hours you'll notice just a significant difference from where they've been uh, through much of the day today. Now the next thing we have to get rid of is the wet weather and that's going to be a little more complicated. First of all the heavy rains moving away you can see this is where we had that heavy rainfall warning that was in place. Now one thing I do want to mention still some ponding water there so that's still something in some of the low-lying areas you want to be concerned about and certainly don't want to be driving through that but you're seeing the heavier stuff is moving away but look at this even a few pockets where we may have the odd thunderstorm towards central Newfoundland just into these earlier evening hours then it's a clearing trend further west but I say it's a little more complicated because the systems we're looking at we've got the one that's moving through then we've got some high pressure then another system yet to come so this clearing off Certainly the heavy stuff in the next hour and a half or so will be gone, but still seeing some scattered showers after that drizzle fog tonight too, patchy fog as we head into tomorrow morning and then that will start to burn off. So taking you through as we're heading into the overnight hours, you see the west coast, that's that next batch, some of that instability behind into tomorrow morning. That clears away and for central and western sections of the island, things are looking pretty good. It's a different story though for western sections of Labrador. This is the morning outlook. I've got your temperature goes from 12 12 to 10 and what's going to happen is it's going to come down even further actually a falling temperature through the day as the next system moves through so just a very quick look then at some of that instability we'll see tomorrow afternoon a few scattered showers again I'm keeping them in the forecast especially though in the morning and certainly we'll have some rain for western portions of Labrador but a look at some of the temperatures there are going to be some nice conditions certainly across the island for tomorrow it's a different story though a little cooler as I say that temperature Labrador City dropping down to six degrees. Now, what happens after that? I'll tell you all about that a little bit later, Debbie. Thank you, Colette. Well, this marks the ninth day of local workers protesting at the site of the long-term care center in Cornerbrook. Iron work workers and tradespeople are accusing a subcontractor of hiring workers from PEI instead of qualified locals. Now, well-known MHA from the area is trying to secure work. Here now is Colleen Connors explains. It's cold and wet, but these dozen or more iron workers and tradespeople aren't going anywhere anytime soon. 
uh, we're looking for local jobs and the jobs are in there and the job is progressing along and uh, we feel that we're qualified people, uh, trades people and as being within uh, anywhere from a half an hour to 10 minutes away from the site, uh, we should be working. They say the main contractor, Marco, and a Prince Edward Island-based subcontractor, McDougal Steel, are using workers from its own province to build the long-term care facility. The demonstrators stationed just outside the work site say the construction companies are discriminating against local qualified workers. MHA for this district, Eddie Joyce, has been by this demonstration site several times and promised them work. I've been working now uh, with the representatives of Marco and I was up visiting the site four or five times and I was told that there will be local people hired on uh, by McDougal. Uh, that was as of last Friday. Joyce says he even told them a place to drop off resumes. He was at the work site and at several other community events while the Liberal Convention went on last weekend in Gander. Joyce. Joyce was removed from the Liberal caucus following complaints of bullying and harassment and hasn't spoke publicly since the end of April. An external review is underway and results are expected the end of July. I, I can't comment on, on any of that, of course. Uh, right now, I'm the member for the Hummer Bay of Islands. I'll do my job the best of my ability to work with whoever I have to improve the district of uh, Hummer Bay of Islands. And uh, as I said, people always say, well, what it's what like being Eddie Joyce again? I always say go ask any mayor, ask any group I deal with, do we deal in a way that we make things better in Hummer Bay of Islands? And I'm sure you'll get the answer, yes. These demonstrators don't agree with Joyce. Murphy feels his promises were fake. I asked the guy four questions. I said, when is this going to happen? He said, I don't know. Uh, how many guys uh, are they going to hire local? He don't know. Well, I basically told the guy that you're wasting your time and my time by coming here and uh, preaching false information to us. You, you got no answers for us. The overseeing contract company Marco awarded the best bid to PEI's McDougal Steel, who have people from the province on the payroll. The company was encouraged to hire local iron workers. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. I could feel the life slipping from myself, that I could feel my body going limp. Just ahead, a serious topic many don't discuss. Strangling can be used during domestic abuse, but can also be overlooked.
Welcome back. It is a frightening and potentially deadly situation that many abused women face. The hands of a loved one wrapped around their necks, squeezing. While domestic abuse victims get punched, kicked and slapped, many, if not most, are also strangled. And strangling often goes unnoticed by police and first responders. Here now is Glenn Payette looks into the impact of what can be a hidden killer and a warning. This story may be disturbing to some. In a St. John's courtroom in early November last year, Sofyan Boleg was designated a dangerous offender. He raped three women in 2012. In one of those cases, Judge Pamela Golding noted, he put his hands around her neck and squeezed until she lost consciousness. What Boleg did wasn't in a domestic situation, but strangulation is very common in domestic abuse. Statistics used by the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention in San Diego say that 30 percent to almost 70 percent of abused women have been strangled. What that means is that someone puts hands, arms, rope, or whatever around the woman's neck and applies pressure. They don't have to kill them, but as many as 25 percent of women who are strangled die that way. Georgina McGraw has been strangled by intimate partners more than once. I could feel the life slipping from myself, that I could feel my body going limp. Um, and you just begged them to stop. And um, sorry. I had a client once who was strangled 200 times. Morag McLean works with the victims of domestic violence in Edmonton and spreads the word about the risks of strangulation. Often victims will experience a strangulation assault and they will appear fine, they'll appear normal uh, at the scene. But that can change dramatically. On its website, the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention says... Victims may have no visible injuries whatsoever, yet because of underlying brain damage due to the lack of oxygen during the strangulation assault, they may have serious internal injuries or die days, even weeks later. A normal man's handshake creates about 80 pounds of pressure per square inch, and it takes far less pressure to stop the flow of blood to and from the brain. Very little pressure uh, can do fairly significant damage. So 11 pounds of pressure per square inch will completely block the carotid artery, which is the main artery taking uh, blood and oxygen to the brain. And 4.4 pounds of pressure will occlude or block the jugular vein. And that's the, the vessel that takes the blood from the brain back down to the, the lungs to be oxygenated. 70% of women who have been strangled believe they were going to die. The psychological impacts of being strangled are many. Depression, suicidal thoughts, nightmares, post-traumatic stress disorder, and more. The psychological uh, effects that it has is tremendous. It still lasts today. It still goes on, even after eight months of counseling. Uh, the nightmares are horrible. Because you know that your hands, that your life is in the, ha in the hands of your abuser. And it's so easy for them to give that little bit more pressure. And many women who are strangled underestimate its impact. They don't see it as a, a very serious form of physical assault. So when we start to talk to them about strangulation, they tend to be quite horrified. Um, and uh, it's a very frightening thing for them to, to learn what the implications of strangulation are. Only 50% of strangulation victims have visible injuries on their necks, and of those, only 15% show up in photographs. McLean says that's why it's important for doctors, nurses, the police, and first responders to ask abuse victims if they have been strangled. Has anyone put anything around your throat? Has anyone applied pressure to your throat? And, and explore from there because victims don't always understand they've been strangled. They should be asking that question. Of course they should. Uh, two hands is just as bad as a knife or a gun. 
While there may not be marks on the neck, there are other indications to look for. Chest pain, difficulty breathing, trouble swallowing, urination, and petechia, or red spots in or around the eye, just to name a few. And the more often a woman is strangled, the more likely she's going to be killed. If the victim survives that particular assault, uh, they're at risk of a future assault where they will be murdered. Georgina McGraw, who you heard in that story, with Senator Fabian Manning, are working to have a comprehensive bill on domestic violence passed through the Senate and then the House of Commons. It calls on health care providers to report incidents of domestic violence, including strangulation, to the police. Currently, only incidents involving knives and guns have to be reported. Glenn Pay at CBC News. St. John's. One of the many, many people that today's blast in Mount Pearl shook is the city's mayor, Dave Aker. After the break, we're going to talk about some of the challenges in running a city that has a considerable industrial park. Stay tuned. Let's meet our first young athlete of the day. This is Kali Folks, who is a busy four-year-old participating in soccer, swimming, and dance. She spends her Saturday mornings with Mount Pearl Soccer Association. And she also takes swimming lessons at Summit Center and dances at Fusion Dance Studio. Great work, Kali. Congratulations to you. And our second athlete of the day, this is Hannah Martin, who is on the dance competition team at Coastal Dance Company. She's in ballet, tap, jazz, hip hop, modern and acro classes while attending ex exam classes as well and in a performing group. Congratulations, Hannah, you're a busy girl.
Well, good for them and good for us as well. We're finally seeing some of that heavier rain moving away and the winds beginning to ease too. That's why the wind warning and rainfall warning have been dropped for the Avalon, the sections that still had them in place. Those are gone. Just having a look at what's happening here though. So we've got the system that's moving out, but there's a trough in its wake. That's going to cause some instability and still some scattered showers, even though the heavier rains moving away through the overnight hours. Then we get this next push coming in through the overnight into tomorrow morning for Western and then it moves right across the island towards tomorrow morning. That moves through some patchy fog as well through the morning hours that we're going to be seeing. So just know about that for visibility. Then we get a little kind of ridge of high pressure that wants to sneak through and then the next system right there on the doorstep and you'll feel it tomorrow with those winds picking up temperatures falling through the day in western Labrador and the rain that'll be moving in there. So that's why it's one of these forecasts where you get some wet conditions then some dry conditions, a little bit of sunshine and that kind of adds to some of the instability and then causes some afternoon scattered showers to even move through. As we take you a little further through Friday afternoon, setting up pretty nicely once we get through some of the rain showers for the Avalon on Thursday and into the long range forecast. Yes, we're still going to see some rain right along the border there through Labrador and as we're heading towards the northern peninsula as well. The next few days dealing off and on with some wet conditions and as we head into Sunday, look at this. So the first half of the weekend is looking pretty good. Then through the day Sunday again from west to east, we're going to watch that rain pushing across the island so that by Sunday, I think afternoon evening, it's still a few days out so we won't marry ourselves to it. But even for the Avalon and St. John's, we'll probably start to see some rain. This is for Western Labrador that falling temperature so starts out at 12 it will fall towards 6 as you head into the afternoon hours and the winds picking up wet conditions for Eastern Labrador tomorrow still some afternoon showers because of the instability 15 degrees but those winds from the northwest towards Cartwright those will be easing for Western Newfoundland actually a decent day getting rid of that fog in the morning once that kind of burns off 19 degrees we'll call it a mix of sun and cloud although in the morning there's that risk of showers and same thing that chance of showers into Thursday, some nice temperatures through the period and at least in most cases getting a peak at sunshine. Central Newfoundland still some of that morning fog, those winds, nothing like today, but still a little gusty from the southwest, low 20s, some beautiful teens, Saturday 22 and ending off with a look St. John's and for eastern Newfoundland 17 degrees for the next few days, a decent start to the weekend and again tomorrow just know a bit of instability and certainly some of that morning fog as well. Anthony. Thanks, Colette. Well, as you can tell, if you look behind us, the rain still coming down on the debris here at Donovan's Industrial Park after this morning's blast, which shook thousands of people, including the mayor of Mount Pearl, Dave Aker. Thank you for coming on live. Well, thanks for having me. So tell me, where were you when the blast happened and what happened? I was in the shower this morning when the blast happened. Felt like the side of the house just came right out of her. We rushed downstairs to see if the hot water heater had blown. It wasn't. Went around, checked our house. Everything was fine, but we could hear the sirens at that point in time. Right, sirens as first responders came to us here. When you look behind us and you see these chunks of debris, the big explosion that obviously pushed up through the roof of the building, what are your thoughts? Well, the first thing comes to mind, all the people that were in the building. Our thoughts go out to the nine employees who were working here this morning and the three that have been taken to the hospital. It's a horrific event that happened, but surely it could have been a lot worse and we were glad that it, that it wasn't. So you see three people uh, taken to hospital, as you mentioned, and everyone's very surprised to some degree that nobody was hurt when you take a look at that blast. Nonetheless, serious incident. Mm -hmm. When you have a municipality that has this much industrial property, does it present special kinds of challenges? It, it does, really, when you look at the residential neighborhoods we have here in Mount Pearl, plus we also have an industrial park. Uh, the uses in the industrial park are fairly, they're fairly light. They're not manufacturing. They're typical of what you see here. It's logistic, uh, logistical companies, storage, repair shops, uh, some warehousing and the like. And uh, generally speaking, this industrial park is very, very quiet. Uh, I live in the neighboring area, which is residential, and uh, there's a buffer between the two. So we've coexisted for a long time so far. There are unique challenges, though. Late last week, the discovery of a mysterious oil. I mean, that's sort of, is that related to having an industrial park? Uh, very much so. And, uh, you know, h here in Mount Pearl, um, you know, we cherish our industrial land because it's a, it's a good tax base for the city to have. Um, but, you know, the two go hand in hand together, right? You know, you need to have the industrial land as well as the, the residential land, but there's no doubt that you have to be monitoring the situation all the time in terms of the uses and, uh, you know, some of the effects that uh, the industrial um, uh, uses can have on your environment. Right. 
Mm -hmm. All right, and I should mention that you wanted to make a tip of the hat to the first responders. You said it was a textbook uh, matter this morning. It was a textbook response. I want to thank all the first responders for getting here, fire, ambulance, uh, the city of Mount Pearl had its staff here, the RNC was here, and we also had all the utilities here, including our own public works, as well as Bell Alliant and, uh, and Newfoundland Power. Listen, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right. That's the uh, Mayor of Mount Pearl, Debbie. Obviously, the investigation's ongoing, and I have a feeling we'll have more, perhaps even hear from the company in the next few days. Back to you. Thanks so much, Anthony. Great coverage of what might have been a much worse situation, as you've been saying, and uh, we'll see you back here tomorrow. Okay. My, oh my, is that a beautiful sky or what? Have a look at that photo and think about it. Where do you think that might be? Where in the world, in Newfoundland or Labrador, is that? Do you have an idea? Gorgeous. We'll tell you after the break. Welcome back once again, and uh, now to a video, Colette, that's uh, been making the rounds of that fearless raccoon who did the impossible, mm -hmm. scaled a 25-story office tower in St. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> and there he goes to the Mission Impossible theme, climbing the building with ease. Biology professors say it's normal for raccoons to climb 20 to 30 feet, but a building of this size is very unusual. We showed you some of the video last week. Now an update. And if you're wondering how it ends, he did come down eventually. Wildlife workers caught him in a live trap, fed him some cat food, mm -hmm. and he's since been released that raccoon onto private land where I'm sure he's uh, climbing the tallest trees he can find. And we've got more photos taken inside the building. As you can imagine, he took a few breaks <laughs> on the way up the 25 story structure. This is uh, on the 23rd floor window ledge, the previous picture. Wow, where he's, he's just scurrying up the side of the building. That's incredible. And lastly, he takes a break on the way Aww. to the top. Well, what a doll. I'm glad it had a happy ending anyway. Till the next time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Maybe he's right. learned his lesson. And what a happy picture we have here. Is this gorgeous or what, Milky Way, this shot? from Swift Current. Did oh. you know that one? And you know, I wondered what the population was. As of the 2011 census, which I know is a while back, just over 200 people in Swift wow. Current. 
They've got that view all to themselves. Isn't those that something? Those lucky people. Jason Edwards sent us a picture recently of the skyline like that from Swift Current. So another dandy. Thanks very much for sending it to us. And we can uh, take those pictures. We'd love for you to send them in at nlphotos at cbc.ca. So keep them coming and we'll share them and you get to guess where in the world or in Newfoundland <laughs> is it? <laughs> That's our program for this evening. Have a great night. See you back here tomorrow.